Welcome to the Business Bites Podcast, the podcast for busy entrepreneurs. Whether you're an online entrepreneur or seeking after brick and mortar success, this podcast brings you quick bites of content so you can learn and grow anywhere you are. Now here's your host, Rachel Brainkey. Put it all out there. Y'all got to stop blaming consumer buying patterns, blaming pricing, blaming oversaturation of your industry. Stop blaming everyone else for where your clients and customers will not buy into you. Because I can almost guarantee that there is any issue that you are causing. And that issue is probably the lack of building buyer's confidence. I'm not talking about the warm fuzzies that you you create with your potential customers or clients through marketing and branding and customer service. I'm not talking about the warm fuzzies. I'm talking about client psychology, buying psychology, customer psychology, little things that are done along the process that helps to build the confidence of the buyer. Subconsciously, they may not realize that all of the things that you're doing and saying are building them up, but they are. It helps to lead them helps to lead the horse to water, helps to lead them to making a buying decision and to buying into you. All right, so now that I said that, I can take a deep breath. Y'all, I came out this podcast really, really on a soapbox because I am exhausted for you guys. I am exhausted hearing over and over and over from people the excuse of, I cannot sell my product or service because of X, Y, and Z. And X, Y, and Z are probably in that list that I gave you guys at the very beginning of this episode. Building buyer confidence is really easy to do. It's stuff you should be doing in your business anyways. I have four specific steps that I want you to follow to build buyer confidence to make it easier for these clients or customers to buy into your product or service. The very first step to building buyer's confidence is providing all important information up front. This is going to sound like it's something that's super common sense and super obvious, but you guys will probably see as you go through this process that you're not actually executing this in the way that you should. Now, I say this because I'm humbling myself and saying this, I have to force myself to run through this list of building buyer's confidence. I have to force myself to look at number one, providing all important information up front. It's really easy when you're the creator of a product or a service or you're an employee of the company and you're always intimately involved with the knowledge of the product or service. It then just becomes common information to you, but is not common information to your potential buyers, right? So we need to make sure that we're providing all the important information up front for them to feel confident in the decision they're going to make. Think of it this way. You invite a friend to come over to your house. You drive your neighborhood all the time. You know where you live. You know how to get there. You start forgetting landmarks. You don't think about road names. You know, you know where you're going. You know which house to pull into without even looking at the number on the mailbox. You know the code to get into the house, right? Your friends who have never been to your house don't know this. And these are what your buyers are. And so you're going to have to give them enough information to get them from point A to point Z, which is purchasing and pulling the trigger on buying with you, right? So we want to make sure we give them as much information to guide them so they feel confident on going through the process of finding your house. Because the thing about it is, too, think about the fact that so many houses now are built to look very similar. The facades look the same on the outside, relatively, especially if you don't go to that neighborhood all the time. And that's also what your buyers are doing. They're just seeing these facades that relatively look the same. But I can guarantee that most every house in your neighborhood is decorated some a different way than the other. They all, It smells a different way. The food tastes a different way. Just the whole aesthetic and feel is completely different. And what they're gonna you're going to receive is completely different after you get past the facade. But you have to get them from getting in their car, driving to the neighborhood, finding the right house, and breaking through what looks like a similar facade to other homes, <clears throat> to other businesses, and so that you can pull them into what you're buying. So provide all the important information up front. This is broken out into a three-step process. First, focus on the solution you have for your buyer's needs, okay? You are providing a solution to them. 
It's not just a warm, good, fuzzy feeling. Well, it might be. That might be the solution to their problem, right? They may be desiring that. So focus on the solution and supplement that with the specifications or the specs of what you're selling. A lot of people have a tendency to do the inverse, and they just go directly to what's included, directly to what the specifications are, and they forget to package it in focusing on the solution or need, and then providing the information of the specs. Now, on the inclusions and exclusions, make sure that you sit back and think about, do you really need to have a big, long exclusions list? Probably not. It's pretty common sense that you only list what's included in a product, but if you do start receiving questions, which brings me to the third step of this, providing all the important information, make sure that you are hitting these pain points. If you're getting a lot of questions about, oh, is this included, and you thought it was common sense that it wouldn't have been included, especially if it wasn't listed, Maybe that's a time that you need to put an exclusion on the product description or in your sales pitch. I don't really think we need to go overboard on the amount of exclusions, but just focus on the solution and need as the first step. Identify the specifications and inclusions. And then also lastly, which kind of just circles around to providing all this important information up front. If you listen to your potential buyers, they are telling you what they need. They're telling you their pain points and they're telling you the frustration part of the buying process when they ask questions. So let's first talk about they tell you the need. If you don't already know your client avatar and what their pain points and needs and all of that are, you need to go over to episode 12, rachelbranke.com forward slash EPI 12. It's the magic of the client avatar. Pause now, go over and do that, and then come back and finish listening to the rest of this episode. Because once you get really clear on your client avatar, their name, their needs, their wants, their desires, their likes, their dislikes, you're going to be able to focus on the solution and need, put the specifications of inclusions, and you're also going to be have a better lens to look through when you're reevaluating your sales process in building of this buyer's confidence. Now, one of the processes that we do in my business, I have multiple brands going on, and so we have multiple different customer service teams. We have different client avatars, even though it may relatively be the same information and type of products and services. One of the workflow processes that we have is we listen to every communication that comes in, social media, email, anything like that, anything customer service that we touch our clients and we get questions and concerns from. We keep a running list with tally marks, <laughs> not really physical tally marks, well, they kind of are. We put them in an Excel spreadsheet so that we all can look at it. And every few months, we reevaluate these top pain points that our customers have, the top questions they're asking, because that's obviously a trip up and it's deteriorating their buyer's confidence. Because the more questions that a buyer has to ask, the le- their confidence starts breaking down, starts chipping off little by little by little by little. You don't want them to have to play the game of 20 questions, but when they do start asking questions, this is when you go back. You do this workflow like I just told you. Outline the top pain points, start making ticks, and at certain junctures in your schedule, start reevaluating how you can change the workflow process, how you can change, the, I'm sorry, the sales process. If it's the product description, the sales pitch, is it what you're putting into social media marketing? These are the things that you need to do and your buyers will tell you. On the flip side, too, it will also give you perfect information for you to be able to put into your social media and blog. If you don't know what to blog about, if you don't know what to put on your social media feeds, listen to the buyers. They're asking questions. They are probably not the only ones with these questions. Turn it into content-based. Stick it into an email newsletter. It can just give you all sorts of information. And all of this comes out through this process of point number one of building a buyer's confidence, which was providing all important information up front, focusing on the solution in need, then supplementing that with the inclusion of the specs, and then go through this process of identifying and re-identifying and re-identifying, rinse and repeat. Number one never ends. You always need to be changing and improving, whether it's your sales pitch or social media marketing or your product descriptions. No matter what industry you're in, brick and mortar online need to be focused on, number one, of providing all the important information up front always needs to be re-evaluated. Number two, in building buyer's confidence, testimonials and social proof. I really don't need to say much more, I think, than that, but I'm going to go ahead and do it for you guys. 
testimonials and social proof. In this day and age of online reviews and online accessibility, where's everybody going? They don't really start Googling off the bat. They might, but it's almost always paired with reading of testimonials or social proof recommendations from other people. Include reviews on all of your products. Include testimonials on all of your websites. Sprinkle testimonials into your social media feed. And in fact, as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, I am giving you guys the outline of your, well, we're going to go through four points, right? So we're on point number two. This is number two in your social media feed. You, I'm going to give you one, two, three, four, then you can go one, two, three, four. Your whole IG feed is going to be filled up right then. Instagram feeds, uh, Facebook, Twitter, go put something for number one, number two, number three, number four, and just rinse and repeat it all around. That will be hitting testimonials and social proof out there. I am going to throw a little tidbit about out here about marketing. Please do not incentivize testimonials and social proof reviews with like discounts or free products. If you do that, then you have to disclaim next to the testimonial and social proof every time that it's used. Oftentimes, it's just easier to ask for the testimonials and social proof and then reward your customers afterwards. You don't have to attach the testimonial incentive to it. That's an FTC regulation. Just keep that in mind. Number three on building Spire confidence. This is the number three point is I highlighted as credentials, but you could almost put what your mama says about you, right? If no one else in the world is going to talk about you, hopefully it's your mama who's going to talk you up. You need to be talking you up because your mama's probably not using your Instagram feed to sell your product. Your mama's probably not on your Twitter there in order to talk about you to sell your service, right? So you need to talk about your credentials. And this is very difficult for people who don't like to talk about themselves. This is very difficult for people who don't want to come across as arrogant. You know, you can be humble and still talk about your credentials and your qualifications and talk yourself up because if you don't do it, who else is going to? And if you don't repeatedly keep that into this workflow and this social media flow with all of these points to build buyer confidence, your customers are not going to have that confidence built up. Little tidbits of where, if you're a photographer, your photography has been seen. If you're a writer where your articles have been published, credentials, qualifications, right? You can put a testimonial from your mama on there. It's probably not going to work as hard hitting as something else like seen in a bridal magazine or on HuffPost or those sorts of places. So make sure you identify credentials and qualifications that work with your client avatar cough, cough, cough. Going back to episode 12, you guys need to talk about the areas that they find and take stock in that helps build their buyer confidence and stick credentials and qualifications that you possess into your social media presence, into your sales process with your buyers. And number four of building buyer's confidence, creating a connection between you and your brand. Number three was also about us, but that was more like, oh, I have this degree, I have that licensure, I've been published here, I've done that. Number four is more the feel good. And if you guys know me, I'm not a big feel good person, I'm more just to get it done, I am what I am, but that's the connection I've created. That's the connection of my brand and that's okay because my client avatar likes it. So create a connection with you or your brand where you don't talk about yourself at all in your... um social media marketing in your sales process. Sounds completely counterintuitive because number one, providing all the important information up front was talking about your products and service. Number two, the testimonials and social proof was third parties talking about you. Number three, your avatars likes, your dislikes, things that you guys have in common together. This is the connection that you're creating to build buyer's confidence. This is the portion of the sales process that often people leave out. The other ones are easy. Writing up of a product description or a pricing sheet. Number two, getting this testimonials or social proof. And three, writing out credentials. Oftentimes people forget to include the connection of who you are as a person or who your brand is. Or on the other end of the spectrum, they focus all on this number four and they really slack on number one, two, and three. So identify where you fall into that process between these four points of building Spire confidence and get these created. Now, just a little homework for you guys to do. 
to implement one through four here, I want you to ask yourself the top 10 things that you need to feel and know before purchasing what you are selling. And actually you could take this question and put it out to your friends, put it out to past purchasers, potential purchasers. You need to get these answers. The reason I don't just say ask your mama or ask your best friend is because they're going to look at it through rose colored glasses and they're gonna give you these feel good fuzzy questions and answers even if they say they're not going to. Start with yourself, ask your team, ask your friends, ask past purchasers, future purchasers, and get a well-rounded view and evaluate it from there. Do not be afraid of analytics. Do not be afraid of questions from your customers or potential customers. Guys, this is giving you formulas, systematic formulaic ways to create and improve the building buyer's confidence and in creating a better and a more effective and successful sales process. So please go through, do this, build the buyer confidence properly. It works with their psychology. It's going to build them up. The less questions they have to ask, the more social proof they see, the more they know about you as a business person and more about you as a person or a brand. Those four points, integrate them into your business. And I promise the excuse of pricing or oversaturation will not even become excuses anymore because you're going to cure it by focusing your potential customers on this increased confidence that they're going to want to buy into you and all those other excuses are just excuses. Thanks for joining Rachel on this episode of The Business Bites. For show notes, a list of recommended tools or referenced episodes, you can find them at businessbitespodcast.com. Until next time.